the Arctic. Millions of square kilometers of empty ice. Polar bears are normally solitary. You might think that just finding a partner in this desolate landscape would be the challenge. But they have an excellent sense of smell and can detect another bear from over the horizon. Male bears can spend weeks tracking the scent of a female who's ready to mate. They sniff closely to size each other up. She'll raise her cubs alone, devoting herself to them for two, even three years. It's a huge commitment of time and effort. So it's vital to pick a male who will provide strong and healthy genes for her offspring. It looks as though she's going to put this potential suitor through his paces. She leads him up and down the slopes. It's as if she's testing his fitness. They start to play. Courtship is one of the few times that adult animals play together. This slope is rather steep for the heavier male. It's no good, he can't quite manage it. But she seems to have decided that he might be the one whilst he seems to have lost interest. It's her turn to do the chasing. And she's got a few tricks up her sleeve. That was enough to entice him up. As the weeks go by, spring turns to summer. The sea ice melts and the ocean gets closer. It means feeding the chicks is easy. So they are growing up fast. They hang out together in small, comforting huddles. But Snow Chick isn't ready to cut the ties, despite being too big for his father's pouch. It's starting to get embarrassing.
It's long overdue, but his father finally persuades him to find his place in the gang. But there's an art to joining a huddle, and he hasn't mastered it. But practice makes perfect, and the first thing to work out is which way to face. You know you've got it right when someone snuggles in behind you. Accepted at last. This is a huge milestone in his development. It means that for the first time, both parents can go fishing. The chick is not so sure he's ready to be left on his own. But the colony has invisible walls, and he instinctively knows they mustn't be crossed. The adults left behind don't have the caring ways of his parents. Until they return, he must find one of the colony's childminders. A penguin who hasn't bred takes on the role as practice for the future. She'll take him under her wing, but only if he does as he's told. She's a firm believer in discipline. With so many chicks in her care, stragglers won't be tolerated. He will just have to toughen up. But there's a reason for the new strict regime. With the warmer days, the open sea is closer now and new and unwelcome visitors can reach the colony easily. A giant petrel. They always pick on the smallest. He's caught, but just by his baby fluff. The childminder is welcome now. It's now a deadly game of hide-and-seek. Luckily, the petrel spots an easier meal of scraps. And the chick has learnt a valuable lesson. At the colony, two weeks have passed. The chicks are testing their independence and spending time away from their mothers. All, that is, except one. As the last to hatch, he's way behind in development. While the older chicks are boisterous and confident, he still feels most comfortable in his mother's pouch. But penguins are sociable birds, and to survive, he must learn to play his part in the colony. It's a daunting prospect. But the little chick finds some courage.
It's a shaky start, but he mustn't lose his nerve. Time for a bit of tough love. With every step, he gains more confidence. It's just as well. He has so many friends to make. But when you're the smallest, it's tough to join the gang. For now, there's always Mum. Out in the open ocean, the fathers are reveling in being back in the water. They haven't eaten for four whole months and have lost half their body weight. To stock up on fish and squid, they hold their breath for up to 20 minutes and dive to nearly 600 meters deeper than any other bird. At the colony, three weeks have passed and the chick is confidently following his mother wherever she goes. He's still learning how things should be done. And how they shouldn't. He soon thinks there's nothing left to learn. So nervous toddler turns cocky explorer. But at this age, she mustn't let him out of her sight. And this bobcat may be in luck. For this particular valley is blessed. A river here never freezes. It's fed by a volcanic hot spring that heats these waters to 50 degrees warmer than the surrounding air. Hungry animals of all kinds come here to feed. Throughout the winter, the river is full of food for those who know how to catch it. Here, even the coyotes have become fishermen. But hunting is hard for a cat that's not used to getting its feet wet. So he must choose his target with care.
golden eye ducks. But can he get close enough to pounce? Perhaps he'll have more luck on the other side. <laughs> Here, steam from the river warms the surrounding trees. So up in the branches, there could be prey. If only he could get to it. It's six meters up. At last, a squirrel. Not much, but enough to keep him going. To survive a winter in these mountains takes tenacity. And bobcats have that in abundance. million tons of snow now blanket this herd's territory. Pushing through deep snow is exhausting work, and the bison are now slowly starving. Just keeping warm saps huge amounts of energy. Their thick coats can insulate them down to minus 20 Fahrenheit. It's now minus 40. The only thing that will keep them alive is buried beneath three feet of snow. And that's a problem shared with a surprising neighbor. The food the fox seeks is also deep beneath the snow. The survival of both creatures depends on getting through to the ground. For the bison, it will be a matter of brute strength. Massive neck muscles enable them to shovel five tons of snow a day. Their lightweight neighbor needs more precision. their goal, a mouthful of withered grass. 
And where the bison have dug, the fox now spots an opportunity. Every footstep counts. But he mustn't break through. Yet. He listens carefully to pinpoint his target. It's moving. but a hundred times more nutritious than a mouthful of dried grass. To get through the winter on these prairies, sometimes brain beats brawn. This is the tundra. Even trees struggle to take root in the icy soil. But life is possible even here. an arctic ground squirrel. He spends his entire winter asleep, out like a light for eight months straight, the longest, deepest hibernation of any animal on Earth. This extreme lifestyle can only be seen using a special filming burrow. He's pretty much stopped breathing. His heart is barely beating. The sun is getting higher every day. In the darkness of his burrow, the squirrel's body clock drags him out of bed. There's no time to waste. Last time he saw it, back in the autumn, this was his territory. Now he's got to fight for it all over again. For the next two weeks, he'll barely have time even to eat. It's a constant battle to keep rival males off his turf. There's a sense of anticipation in the air. Females emerge a few days later. He won't want to miss his first date. And there she is. But what's he doing? She'll only be fertile for 12 hours in the entire year. There's no time for hesitation. He cautiously makes his move. She might be in a hurry, but she can still be choosy. that while there are other males around, she could easily go off with someone else. 
so he won't leave her side for 24 hours. An Alaskan spring moves fast, and if you don't seize the moment, it will pass you by. A Sami family has agreed to teach me everything they know about the Northern Lights, reindeer, and surviving in the Arctic wilderness. Hello, hello. Oh, hello. hello. You're the man I've come this far north to meet. Hello, <laughs> welcome. I'm Gordon. My Lovely to meet Petri. you. Nice to meet you, Petri. So I read it's very it's rude to ask someone how many reindeer they have. Is that correct? Yeah, because I don't ask you how much money in the bank you have. I have no money in the bank <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> I can see the sort of 40 at least here. So these are, yeah, I, have I don't want to know. I don't want, if it's rude, I don't want to know. I, I, can, <laughs> I can count them. Petri Matis started looking after reindeer when he was just two years old. He comes from a long line of Sami reindeer herders and still follows the traditional ways. So your shoes, are they, is that reindeer fur? Yes. Yeah. Much, much better what you have now. Really? And it's really best one when there's minus 30, minus 40. Goodness. And uh, cold as with this it's been, it's uh, 1999 January. There's one week and there's minus 50, right? Whoa, really? So when it's down as low as minus 50, you don't see reindeer shaking and shivering? No, if they get enough wood in the forest, no problem with that cold weather. Reindeer evolved during the Ice Age. There are reports of them living in temperatures as low as minus 70. Petri leaves me in charge of feeding time, so I can take a closer look at these incredible animals. Hey, you. Over here. There we go. It is amazing to be eyeball to eyeball, nose to nose with a reindeer. The first thing I'm struck by is their winter coat, which is up to seven centimetres thick. Fur covers almost every part of their body. It's almost impossible to sink my hand into this dense fur. It is unbelievably thick. You can't part the hairs and see the skin beneath. Not only is the hair super thick, but each one of these hair fibres is, is hollow. So the animal is insulated and in each individual hair is insulated with that air void in the middle. Everything about them from their feet to the tops of their antlers from the tip of their nose to the end of their tail, they adapted to survive in one of the harshest environments on Earth. All reindeer here eat the Cladonia group of lichen, a nutritious mix of algae and fungi. It grows all over these northern forests. So finding food for the reindeer on my journey won't be an issue. Today, sunset is around quarter past two in the afternoon. It's the ideal time to try out a specialist camera I've brought to film the northern lights. And now I've got the perfect subjects to test it on. Hey boys. Watch, I'm coming through. Got my own version of antlers right here. Come on. This is one of the most light sensitive cameras in the world. I have to say that these images look beautiful in this, in this light. A short time ago, if you wanted to film in these light levels, you'd have to film in, in infrared and then everything is seen in, in black and white. But this camera picks up color and that's what I really want, is not just to see the, the northern lights and the shapes that they make in the sky, and to see that there are lights in the sky, but to actually see the richness of colour, hopefully even see colours that I can't even see with my, my own eyes. And filming the reindeer is a good way to actually just get a sense at this time of night of what this camera can do. And my favourite, friendlier reindeer isn't camera shy. <laughs> Keep your antlers out of my lens. This is really exciting. I'm really looking forward to the next stage of this adventure, heading off into the wild with, with my reindeer.
I've got one more day left with Petri, and today he wants to show me how to drive a reindeer sleigh. I know which reindeer I'd like to use, but I need to see what Petri thinks. Hello, boys. See, I quite like, I quite like this one. It seems friendlier. Is this, is this a good one for yeah, pulling my sleigh? Yeah, well, this good one, but we take this for It's a better you. one? Yeah. Why is that? It's uh, not so old like this one. Really? Because I was going for which one, which one I liked the most. <laughs> the friendliest one. It does make sense to take the bigger, stronger reindeer. But he just puts me a bit on edge. There's one thing that I, I don't quite like about the reindeer. I should speak a bit more quietly because I don't want it to hear me. Is that it's got, um, it's got quite an, an aggressive looking part of its antler that comes straight out. And every time I'm close to it, I think it's going to gouge my eye out. But I suppose it's about selecting the best reindeer for the job. The job is to, to pull a sleigh. <laughs> To get to grips with sleigh riding, Petri wants me to follow him on an eight kilometer circuit of a frozen lake. Okay, are you, sir, you are ready? Yes, I'm positive, I'm ready. Okay, and here's the hospital, it's about 70 kilometers. In which direction? <laughs> that way. Okay, 70 kilometers. Do you know where the hospital is? <laughs> Hopefully we won't need that. <laughs> ready? Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. While he may be the strongest reindeer, it seems he's also the most stubborn. Everything is okay. Come on. I really hope this isn't a sign of things to come. Once my reindeer does get going, I can enjoy the ride. Come on. There's something very, very nice about being pulled along through the snow by a reindeer. You can see why Santa's done this all these years. It's not something you could grow tired of. Reindeer make driving a sleigh easy. A gentle tap with the rope is all that's needed to keep them going. Their splayed hooves act like snowshoes. Come on, boy. So they can pull hundreds of kilos in weight. And if the conditions are right, they can cover nearly 50 kilometers in a day. That's quite, I suppose it's moving at the kind of pace that I could walk at. But the one thing it does do, it gives me the opportunity to look around and enjoy the, the world about me. And it's beautiful. It is a winter wonderland. Reunited at last. The mother sees her chick for the first time. She's keen to start parenting, but the father needs persuading to surrender the chick he's been caring for all winter. He must now put his chick at risk. In these temperatures, it could freeze in seconds. The male will have to let go. Eventually, the transfer to the mother is safely made. <coughs> the chicks grow quickly on a diet of fish and squid.
soon they're keen to explore, but always with mother in tow. This chick is less fortunate. Its mother has not returned to claim it. Another orphan is searching for a new family, but this female already has a chick of her own. Some orphans receive too much mothering from penguins whose own chicks have not survived. The urge to parent is so strong that they will compete with one another to adopt any chick they find. Many of these squabbles end in tragedy, as the poor chick is trampled to death. Those chicks that do have parents quickly learn survival skills. Even in spring, they must huddle together for warmth, just as their fathers did in the depths of winter. A group of chicks has got lost in the blizzard. Cold and disorientated, they search for the colony. It will not be long before the storm claims its first victims. By early summer, the chicks are surprisingly well-developed and now look ready to take on the world. Those that survive their first year have the best possible start in life thanks to the extraordinary hardships endured by their parents. Parents who battled with the Antarctic winter and won. Finally, with the skies completely clear, I get a glimpse of the phenomenon I've been searching for. It's not what I was expecting. It's just like a big sort of smear across the, the sky. It stretches round in a kind of rainbow. That's a single colour of green all the way round to the horizon on that side. What I'm really hoping for is that classic northern lights big flowing river of light, a big ribbon through the sky. This is tantalizingly close to seeing what I've come here to see. As quickly as they appeared, the lights vanish. I have no way of telling when or if they'll come back. Without cloud cover, temperatures plummet to minus 25. What could this be? This level of coldness actually makes you really tired. You're using up a lot of energy just to stay warm without even moving, moving around. It's like everything's cold. You feel the cold coming up from the ground. It's coming in from all sides. It's just sort of all consuming. And I'm just wondering if there is, if I have a a cut-off point if it's going to get so cold that it's, it's not going to be possible to, to stand out here. My eyes begin to play tricks on me and I start to question what I'm seeing. There is something happening in the sky but neither my eyes nor my camera can fully see it as the northern lights. It's weird because at times it looks like look like clouds moving very fast. And then as it is at the moment, look at that, it's just burst into life. Holy smokes, gee whiz. That is phenomenal. It just changes in an instant, look at that. My goodness, that is something else. It's 
starts off as a sort of almost an underwhelming cloud and suddenly it starts to shift and take form and the lights start to dance and flicker and move and what is just a smear becomes this sort of rich texture that's moving across the sky from horizon to horizon. Every single second is, is precious and you get a sense every moment you watch this that as far back in time, all those millions of years that this has been taking place, it has never been like this before. And then it changes again. After a couple of hours, the aurora builds to an incredible crescendo. These particles from the sun have travelled nearly 150 million kilometres. It's quite hard to take it all in. It is just, it is so grand, so spectacular. It is, it's mind-blowing. I couldn't have filmed any of this without my reindeer's help. After a bumpy start, I can't imagine being here with anyone else. And I want something special to remember our time together. That's a boy, you handsome, handsome man. Yeah, good fellow. Who said reindeers don't like hugs? Good boy. Right, okay. Right. We'll do a selfie. You know what a selfie is, don't you? Everyone does, even reindeer. You've got to lift your head, best smile. Right, boy. Look this way. Three, two, one. This has been an incredible journey. And to top it off, I think I've got my Christmas card sorted.